Amendment motion for the Private International Law Implementation of Agreements Bill. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That this Assembly endorses the principle of the extension of the provisions of the Private International Law Implementation of Agreements Bill to Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call the Minister for Justice to move the motion. Minister. Uh, Mr Pr uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that this Assembly endorses the principle of the extension of the provisions of the Private International Law Implementation of Agreements Bill to Northern Ireland. The Private Thank International you. Law. Sorry, I have to make an... Sorry, Minister. Um, I have to inform members the Business Committee has agreed there should be no time limit on this debate. So I now call the Minister to open the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Private International Law Implementation of Agreements Bill, as its name suggests, deals with the implementation of international agreements in the field of private international law. Private international law rules are applied by litigants and courts to cases involving a foreign element. The rules typically cover jurisdiction, for example, which country's court should hear a case, which country's law should apply to resolve it, and whether the decisions of a foreign court should be recognised and enforced. They apply to civil law cases, including commercial, insolvency and family law matters, and are a technical and highly specialised area of the law. Without private international law rules, businesses, individuals and families in Northern Ireland engaged in cross-border legal disputes face more uncertain, expensive and longer proceedings. Countries may enter into international agreements on private international law with other countries to ensure that the same rules are applied on a reciprocal basis. This bill ensures that these international agreements can be implemented in our domestic law in a timely way. It is a short bill with only two substantive clauses, and this legislative consent motion is concerned with extending the whole bill to Northern Ireland. The bill has two key functions. Firstly, implementing in domestic law the three Hague Conventions, which currently apply in the UK, but the UK's participation in them is linked to its EU membership. The UK will be an independent party in its own right to these conventions at the end of the transition period, and the Bill is required to ensure no gap in the domestic application of these conventions. Secondly, it creates a power to implement future private international law agreements through secondary legislation. Without this, primary legislation would be required for implementing each new agreement. This power is also likely to be required before the end of the transition period. The UK has a dualist legal system in which an international treaty ratified by the government, although binding in international law, does not alter the laws of the state unless and until the treaty is incorporated into domestic law by legislation, such as through this bill or the regulation powers under it. On the regulation making power, the bill is drafted to respect the devolution position a Northern Ireland Department may make provision for implementation in Northern Ireland with UK ministers only being able to do so with the consent of a Northern Ireland Department. Legislation in this technical area has in the past been taken forward on a UK-wide basis and it may be convenient for it to be so in the future, so I consider this to be a sensible approach. The Assembly or Parliamentary Affirmative Procedure will be triggered if the regulations are implementing a new international agreement for the first time in domestic law or any arrangements within the UK or between the UK and an overseas territory or crown dependency. To create, extend or increase the penalty for a criminal offence or to amend primary legislation. Otherwise, negative resolution procedures will apply. Having an assembly bill specifically for these purposes in place for the end of the transition period would be unrealistic in terms of time frame. This bill would secure reincorporation of the three Hague Conventions in question across the UK at the same time. Otherwise, we would risk people in Northern Ireland not benefiting from these conventions. For example, without Hague 2007, which covers cross-border maintenance applications, we risk causing financial hardship for the children of Northern Ireland resident parents. Similarly, having the regulation making powers for the end of the transition period ensures the implementation of future agreements in Northern Ireland in line with the rest of the UK. Otherwise, we risk delaying the benefits of these new arrangements for litigants in Northern Ireland. I therefore consider that it would be preferable for this bill to extend to Northern Ireland, and members will have seen that the Justice Committee's report on this legislative consent motion endorses this view. 
I appreciate that the Assembly's preference is to legislate on Northern Ireland matters wherever possible, and indeed this would be my own preference. However, in this instance, it seems sensible for the Bill to extend to Northern Ireland for the reasons I have outlined, and therefore I ask that the Assembly support the terms of this legislative consent motion. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I call the Chair of the Justice Committee, Mr Paul Given. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, I am very pleased to speak on behalf of the uh, Committee for Justice in the debate today. The Minister uh, wrote to the Committee in February advising of this potential LCM for the Private International Law Bill, uh, which was introduced in Westminster. Uh, the Minister advised that uh, she was content in principle to support the extension of the provisions of the Bill to Northern Ireland, and this would see the implementation in domestic law of three Hague Conventions the Minister has outlined in respect of child protection and cross-border disputes, uh, choice of court and cross-border contracts, and maintenance in relation to rules for recovery of child support and other forms of family maintenance. The committee did take oral evidence from the Department of Justice officials in March 2020. Uh, during that evidence session, concerns were raised with regard to other provisions of the bill relating to the regulation-making powers. These provisions will allow future private interna international law agreements to be implemented in domestic law by secondary legislation, uh, which will be made either at Westminster or uh, by a Northern Ireland department. Members questioned how decisions would be made as to whether Westminster or the Assembly is the most appropriate place to legislate, what role this Assembly or Assembly committees will have if Westminster is legislating, uh, or why legislation will not be made in this place if we have the power uh, to do so. Following the evidence session, the committee agreed that it would be useful to determine the views of other relevant committees in uh, Scotland and Wales on these regulating uh, making provisions. Unfortunately, proposed LCMs had not been considered in either jurisdiction at the time, although I understand um, they may be being considered by the Justice Committee uh, of the Scottish Parliament today. In follow-up correspondence to the committee following the oral evidence session, the Department stressed that the Secretary of State will only legislate in Westminster with the consent uh, of a Northern Ireland Department. Uh, the Department advised that where justice is the Northern Ireland Department in question, the Minister would notify the committee in advance as to whether she intends to provide or withhold consent. The Department also emphasised that future regulations would not entail significant policy choices but would implement future international agreements in law and make the necessary supporting procedural changes. When considering this further information, the committee noted uh, the arrangements may also impact on the responsibilities of other departments, such as economy, finance and health. The committee therefore wrote to those committees, drawing attention to these regulations, um, uh, which may require those departments giving consent to the Secretary of State for future regulations under the provisions. I understand that the Committee for Finance has engaged with the Department of Finance and it has recently confirmed that it is con uh, content uh, with the LCM that is before the House today. On 23 April, the Committee considered the memorandum that had been laid by the Department of Justice on 20 April and the Committee agreed that it was content with the proposal to extend provisions to implement three Hague Conventions in domestic law and create the power to implement future PAL uh, arrangements, uh, agreements in domestic law and create the power to implement future um, pillar agreements in domestic law via secondary legislation. Uh, in the Private International Law Bill to Northern Ireland by way of a legislative consent motion. Um, uh, when considering the report on the LCM at our meeting on 30 April, um, the Deputy Chair of the Committee, Linda Dillon, placed on record her continuing concerns regarding the regulating uh, making powers provided by the LCM, indicating that she was not content with the explanation that the Department had given in relation to this issue, um, but did, however, indicate uh, that she would not object to the LCM uh, proceeding. I am sure um, Linda will elaborate on that when she makes a contribution. Um, but I can confirm a set out in the Committee report that the Committee for Justice supports the Minister for Justice in seeking the Assembly's endorsement of the legislative uh, consent motion. Just speaking in a personal capacity now, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I wanted to use this um, as an example, I think, of some areas of concern that I have around the business that this House is taking forward. Um, in and of itself, I have no objection to, to this LCM. Indeed, I have no difficulty with it coming forward. I support the ongoing work of the Justice Committee dealing with uh, issues such as this coming before it. Um, and we will have another LCM coming forward in respect to the Commonwealth Games, for example, in Birmingham. 
Um, but I know uh, all of the committees were asked to write to their departments to outline what is deemed essential COVID-19 related business work, and that committees should only be receiving what is deemed to fit within that criteria. Um, we have continued to receive things uh, which may well be deemed as very important. This is one such example. Whether it meets the test of being essential COVID-19 related business is one that I think uh, could be subject to debate. My own personal view is I have no problem with it. I am happy to take it. I am happy for the committee to continue to receive this type of ongoing work. But it does bring up the issue in a broader sense that Members are only allowed to submit two written questions per week. There are no oral questions in this House. There are no private members' motions being brought forward in this House. And yet, executive departments are allowed to continue to bring forward executive related issues. The Minister for Infrastructure brought forward it in relation to electric bikes. Again, I have no problem with it. I have no difficulty with that. I support that being conducted through the business of this House. But there is an issue about what executive business and what ministers regard could I ask essential. The, could I ask the member to resume his seat just briefly? I take on board very seriously what the member has raised, and I hope that he will always find in me someone who will defend the rights of backbench members to scrutinise and hold the executive to account. Some of the issues that he has raised, I know, have been discussed at the business committee. His remarks are now in Hansard, and it is there for all time and for all to see. Can we try and get back to the LCM? I will, and, and thank you. And I'm not privy to the business committee. It would be inappropriate for me to, to be so. Um, but I do flag it up as an issue. Uh, the committee is going to have uh, meetings all of the month of June in respect to the domestic abuse bill, which is very important. We will be meeting every week, and therefore we need to be able to conduct our business. The current arrangements will provide difficulties for the Justice Committee in doing that. So, I trust that is being taken on board at the Business Committee. I hope that it is, um, because it will be important going forward that the Justice Committee is able to carry out the important work, and, pri and members can bring forward their own private members' motions, of which a lot of us received correspondence over the last weekend. I will resume my seat. Principal Deputy Speaker. <laughs> I come to Linda Dillon. I am sure you will be glad to hear my, my comments are going to be very brief. And it is just to put on the record, as, as the Chair has already outlined, we did um, highlight some concerns around the fact that this simply comes back to the Minister and does not come to the Committee. And regardless of what the issue is or, or how small the matter is, I do believe that the Committee has a very important role to play, not only in terms of scrutiny and ensuring that, that they are content with what the Department is doing, but also for the Minister to have us as a sounding board, as an advisory board as well, because there is a wealth of experience within the committee. I am not sure I include myself in that just yet, because I am fairly new onto the committee, but there is a wealth of experience there, and people who have been on previous justice committees that, that can give advice in, in regards to certain matters. So I do think that it is extremely important that the committee has an opportunity to look at anything that's coming forward in terms of whether it's legislation, whether it's policy, whether it's guidelines or whether it's technical. We have an important role to play. But having said that, as has already been outlined, I don't think mm. that it's an issue over which we should block this LCM. So we are supporting the LCM today and thank the Minister for coming to the House. Thank you. I call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome uh, the Minister's introduction. It was most en enlightening in terms of the principles behind the legislative consent motion for someone who doesn't serve on the Justice Committee. But I do think there are some important points to be made. And it is right and proper that uh, there is a seamless protection and safeguards written into the legislation post uh, Brexit and uh, the transition period to ensure important issues such as child protection are uh, legislated for and the uh, highest level of safeguard protection is in place internationally. So I welcome that. I, I noted uh, the Minister's uh, comments around uh, capacity in terms of uh, her own department and indeed the fact that this uh, is Westminster legislation that I think, if I'm right in paraphrasing, we'd be piggybacking on and it would be the exception rather than the rule. And I think with that proviso, proviso um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we're happy to support that it, so long as these uh, are the exception rather than the rule. 
I call Mr. Doug BD. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for um, uh, bringing this forward to, to today. I mean, it's a technical LCM, uh, but it's an important one, and we are in free fall now to the 31st of December, uh, and we can't just let these things just uh, roll on. We, we have to address them, and we have to address them now. So I think it's right to uh, ad address them now. And of course, uh, I rise. Um, to absolutely support uh, this LCM. Um, but as I look at it, I, I, I mean, I, I just want to extrapolate a little bit, if I can. Um, one, of the, one of the conventions is the 1996 Hague Convention on the Child Protection, uh, which improves the protection of the child in cross-border disputes, helps resolve issues around custody uh, and contact with parents, parents with, with children who live in different um, parts. But we have our own problems here in Northern Ireland because uh, breaches of court orders in, in relation to um, family proceedings are never really uh, enforced. Uh, I've got a constituent who has sole custody of his um, children but yet hasn't seen them for six years because the case is lost in the courts with endless legal aid uh, allowing it to go on in, in perpetuity. And indeed, uh, if we look at what Lord Gillen said uh, in his review of the civil and military courts, uh, the civil and family uh, law courts, um, he stated that although a judge will do whatever is necessary to keep a parent out of prison, breaches of court orders must be addressed. Parties must not be permit permitted to willfully obstruct court orders without consequences. So I raise this issue um, in brevity, if I can, because I think there is a real concern that as we go into this LCM, what we haven't done is put our own house in order in, in dealing with issues like this. Uh, and we are not enforcing uh, court orders in this jurisdiction. Uh, and that's only going to get more complicated when we start looking at as cross-jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you. No other member has indicated. Nope. No other member has indicated uh, that they wish to speak in this. So I call the minister to wind the debate on the motion. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you um, to the Assembly for taking time to consider this motion and for the contributions that were made in the debate. Um, I would like to thank the Justice Committee for its report um, and also the Executive Committee for its consideration of the issues at hand. I'm pleased with the support colleagues have shown in the recognition um, that on this occasion it is sensible that the Westminster Bill um, extend here. I do want, if I may, just to answer a number of issues that were raised by members in the debate. Firstly, with respect to the Chair, my understanding of the sittings of the Assembly is that we can bring forward those matters which are COVID-related or those matters which are urgent. And this has a degree of urgency in that this uh, private international law needs to be in place three months before we leave the European Union. And we need to move in lockstep um, with Westminster and the other devolved administrations to ensure that that is possible. Um, I do not control the timing of Brexit, um, but it will happen at the end of December unless the government seek an extension. And therefore, it's absolutely critical that we have these uh, conventions written across into domestic legislation. And therefore, both myself and my colleagues in the executive believe that this was of sufficient urgency that it needed to be brought forward to the Assembly and to the committee at this time. With respect, yes, I will, sure. I appreciate the Minister giving way on that, and I don't disagree with how she's characterised the urgency associated with this. One issue that, that I would put that private members aren't able to bring forward, for example, is to debate the abortion issue that Westminster will vote on in June. There is an urgency for this House to express a view before Westminster votes. That is an urgent issue to a lot of constituents. Would she agree with me that that's an issue that this Assembly should debate? Well, it isn't for me to take a position on the business of the House. That is a matter for the Whips, along with the Speaker, to decide. I don't set the agenda for the Assembly. I simply um, play my part in discharging my duties under it. When it comes to the issue of termination of pregnancy, as you know, it has been decriminalised. So I no longer have a role to play in that debate, and you would need to take up any issues about wanting to debate issues and the urgency of them with the Minister of Health. Um, with respect then to um, the query that I've received um, with respect from Linda Dillon, um, the issue here is about having swift implementation. So in terms of what has been a uh, what has been proposed. It is in order that where we are dealing with very highly technical um, and beneficial laws, we will be able to move and, uh, if you like, have those benefits for our citizens uh, without unnecessary delay. However, an affirmative procedure will be triggered in situations, for example, if it's going to implement an agreement for the first time, so that hasn't previously um, been discussed, and that will ensure that there is adequate scrutiny from this legislature um, and that members are given the opportunity 
agree um, to make a contribution, which I also agree is hugely important in terms of guiding and informing the process. Um, if I move on then um, and welcome the remarks um, from uh, Dolores Kelly, um, she is of course correct that this is driven by Brexit and I think it's hugely important that we're able to do this today. It would be remiss of me not to say that what we are doing today will allow us to continue to operate private international law um, and to bring the Hague Conventions um, into our law. We will also, I understand, in Westminster be seeking to join um, potentially the Lugano Convention. I think that application has already been made, which again should improve things. But we should be under no illusion that we will still be in a suboptimal position with respect to the agreements that we have um, at the end of this process. So we have, if you like, covered most of the bases, but there will still be more complexity than would otherwise have been the case. Finally, then, um, the comments um, with respect um, uh, to uh, Mr Doug Beattie. This is a very specific piece of legislation which deals with cross-border issues. Um, I think it's unfair to say that we have not made progress with respect to dealing with issues around family justice. Um, for a start, we have, as he referred to, um, the Gillen Reviews, and we now have an implementation plan and significant work being undertaken within the department in recognition of that um, particular challenge. We're also, um, and hopefully with the cooperation um, of the committee, we're going to be in a position to look at committal reform later this year, so look at it speeding up justice more generally. Um, and so I think that there are a number of steps that we are taking to ensure um, that we don't have continued abuse, particularly, I think, of the family court system um, by those who wish to continue to exercise some kind of course of control over former partners. That is something that is captured in the domestic abuse bill, which we have debated at length in the House at second reading and will no doubt have an opportunity to debate again. So I therefore believe that in the context in which we're in, it is appropriate that the private international law implementation of agreements bill extends to Northern Ireland, and I would ask for the support of the House in passing the motion today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Item number four on the order paper is the adjournment. Before I put the question, I want to remind members that the next plenary sitting of the Assembly is Tuesday.